On the 1st of April 1990, Arizona State Trooper Michael Miller pulled to the side of Interstate 10 in Casa Grande to inspect a parked truck. When he peered through the windows of the cab, he couldn't believe what he saw. The face of a petrified woman chained up like an animal. He immediately handcuffed the truck driver and put him into his patrol car. I think he was probably thinking, how am I going to get out of this one? What do I do now? Way back to bed. Invite me back. I think that's about as far as I better go. Michael didn't know it yet, but he'd apprehended a cold-blooded serial killer, Robert Ben Rhodes. He is without doubt one of the most dangerous men ever to have stalked the American highway. For over a decade, Rhodes had been raping, torturing and killing vulnerable women across the country. But he'd remained completely undetected. I think that Robert Ben Rhodes is probably the most evil person I've ever met in my life. And I've met a lot of evil people. The police were only just discovering the gruesome crimes of Robert Ben Rhodes, one of the world's most evil killers. When 66-year-old Robert Ben Rhodes pleaded guilty to the murders of Douglas Siskowski and Patricia Walsh in March 2012, it took his official tally of victims to three. But investigators suspect he's killed dozens more. It's believed that the long-distance truck driver was active from the mid-1970s, preying upon vulnerable hitchhikers and sex workers across America. Rhodes' victims were people who would readily get into his truck. He wouldn't have to coerce them to do so. He's looking out for people who are vulnerable. He's looking out for people who need help from truck drivers and motorists. So these are individuals where he already has the access and he already has the opportunity. It was a routine check of his parked trailer by an Arizona state trooper in April 1990 that led to Rhodes' dark secrets being revealed. The truck driver's horrific crimes may have been discovered accidentally, but it would take the ingenuity of three detectives across two states to help bring the serial killer to justice. Detective Michael Sheely first heard the name Robert Ben Rhodes while investigating a murder in Illinois. He'd been a truck driver for a long time and gave him a great deal of opportunity to find victims at local truck stops along the interstate, hitchhikers, which we know were victims. So he had a great deal of opportunity for such a predator as he was, and that's exactly the words that he is. He was a predator. FBI Special Agent Bob Lee worked with Michael to find out more about Rhodes. He not only kidnapped women, but he kept them and tortured them for as much as two or three weeks at a time. Uh, and that made him uh, a special kind of evil, as I saw him. A decade after Rhodes had been imprisoned for murder in Illinois, Texas Ranger Brooks Long uncovered two more victims of Rhodes. I would say that he had the ability to be Mr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He was able to coerce people to trust him and gain confidence in his good old boy laid back attitude. But once he had their trust and their guard was down, then you saw the real Robert Ben Rhodes come into play. The story of this transient killer begins in November 1945. Robert Rhodes was born in Council Bluffs, Iowa. He was mostly raised by his mother as his military father, Ben, spent a lot of time overseas. So there are periods of time when Rhodes' father is away from the family home, and, and I think there's a sense in which 
he perhaps misses him. There's a sense in which that the family feels incomplete and there's a longing for an attachment to his father. But when his father returns, he's quite brutal. He's quite violent towards him. So I think he did feel this conflict about his relationship with his father all the time. It was a relationship that soured further when Rhodes was a teenager. When Rhodes was 16, his father was convicted for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old girl. So his father was essentially an abuser. And this behaviour was a reflection of a misogynistic value system that he had, that women and girls were there to be used and abused, that they served a, a function for men. And I think that was something that would have cemented itself in Rhodes's mind. Ben was a army veteran and a firefighter. He could hardly be a more upright member of the community. So imagine the shame that would have fallen upon him for his arrest for sexually lascivious behavior. I think another important thing when we look at his father's conviction is his father's response to it. So he takes his own life shortly after he's convicted of this crime. And in this case, suicide is the ultimate act of control. It's the ultimate way of saying, I'm not going to take responsibility for my own actions. I'm going to decide to opt out of this whole thing altogether. Was it that that made the change to Rhodes's character? Was it that that flicked the switch? Rhodes was a college dropout who'd also failed in becoming a police officer. He went through numerous jobs and two failed marriages, never seeming to settle. By the late 1970s, though, he'd found the job that would define his murderous career. Eventually, Rhodes finds a job that suits him down to the ground, and that's the job of a long-haul truck driver. So here, he has long periods of time when he's unsupervised, he's off the grid, he doesn't have to answer to anybody, and here, he gets the chance to spend long periods of time on his own, ruminating, fantasizing, and I think this is a very dangerous period in his life. At the age of 41, Rhodes married his third wife, Deborah, but his sexual perversions would eventually lead to their separation. Their relationship, she was disillusioned when the marriage went on because Rhodes wanted to go to a swinger club here in Houston. That was something that she didn't want to do, but he kept pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope. Rather than just accepting that and saying, OK, that's fine, he pointed to her and said, well, clearly there's a problem with you. You need to loosen up. So this is showing me that, that his relationships, if you'd call them that with women, they weren't based on mutuality or respect or love or affection. They were simply a way of him getting what he wanted. Deborah admitted subsequently how badly she'd been abused by Rhodes, the man who thought nothing of handcuffing her to the bed or raping her so badly that she feared for her life. But it's undoubtedly true that that form of sexual abuse was the signature that was to develop throughout Rhodes' crimes. Rhodes had an uncontrollable sexual appetite. Working as a long-distance truck driver presented him with the perfect opportunity to act out his aggressive sexual perversions on strangers he would meet along the road, with or without their consent. I think it's important to emphasise here the term consent, because there are people who will consensually engage in this kind of behaviour. But when it came to Rhodes, he didn't care whether people consented to it or not. He wanted to do this, and whether or not people were happy with that was just completely disregarded. In February 1990, a distressed young woman flagged down passing motorists. She claimed she'd been abducted by a truck driver and kept hostage for two weeks. She was subject to torture, sexual assault and rape. And she actually had a leash round her neck when she was found by passing motorists. So this was a victim of Rhodes. This was somebody who had luckily managed to escape with her life. The police drove the young woman across Houston, 
looking for Rhodes' truck. And they immediately started searching for it, and they found it. But uh, when they brought Rhodes out to the car for her to look at him, she just looked down, would not uh, identify him, said, that's not him. It was an opportunity to stop Rhodes that sadly wasn't taken. Later that day after they let him go, she told him that that was him, but she was too afraid to identify him, even though there were two police officers by her side. She had been completely terrorized and traumatized during the two-week ordeal. Rhodes is such a terrifying man that he puts literally the fear of God into this young woman. Now, that must have even further confirmed Rhodes' absolute sense of invulnerability. It must have even further inflated his already overinflated ego. A chance to put Rhodes safely behind bars had been missed. For now, he remained free to stalk the highways. By the spring of 1990, the 44-year-old had been living as a sexual predator and a murderer for over a decade, but nobody had any idea. His veneer of lies was about to come crashing down. On the 1st of April 1990, a state trooper named Michael Miller spied a truck on Interstate 10 in Casa Grande, Arizona. I observed a truck parked on the side of the road with his emergency lights on, but he had no triangles out. So I went up uh, alongside of the truck, to, I pulled behind the truck, had my lights activated to go up and check on the driver of the truck and see what his situation was. Armed with a flashlight, Michael took a look through the windows of the truck. I saw some lights in the back of the, in the sleeper berth and peered in the window of the driver's side of the truck. And when I showed my flashlight in, I heard a, uh, a woman started screaming. And what I saw was a woman that looked like she had a horse bit in her mouth. Shocked to see a woman with a metal restraint strapped to her mouth, Michael was even more surprised when a man appeared out of the darkness of the cab. The driver came sliding out of the sleeper berth and then came on down to the pavement and put his hands up against the side of the truck. And he said, that's OK, officer, everything's fine. We are consenting adults. And uh, I still heard screaming coming from inside the, the truck. And he said, I've got a gun in my rear pocket. And I patted him down, felt it, took it out, put it in my pocket, and then handcuffed him, took him back to my patrol car. I think he was probably thinking, how am I going to get out of this one? What do I do now? With the man seemingly restrained, Michael headed back to the truck. And when I got back up there and looked inside, I saw a completely naked female. And I, I took a blanket that was there and covered her up. Told her that she was uh, OK, that the police were taking care of it, and the, the driver would not bother her anymore. But had Michael waited a minute more, the man in his car, Robert Ben Rhodes, would have been free. Well, I went back to my patrol car, and Mr. Rhodes had uh, got his handcuffs in front of him, and he was in the process of trying to get a key in his pocket to get his handcuffs off. If he'd have done that, he'd have been gone. He'd have fled the scene. Robert Ben Rhodes was arrested and taken to Casa Grande Police Department. She went back to bed, invited me back. I think that's about as far as I've ever gone. Detectives wanted to know more about the man whose home address was over a thousand miles away in Houston, Texas, under the jurisdiction of FBI agent Bob Lee. He had been arrested the night before and they asked me to get some background information on Rhodes since he lived in Houston at the time. The young girl had been through a traumatic ordeal at the hands of Rhodes. When the victim was interviewed by the detective, she tells him that uh, Rhodes agreed to give her a ride. She said that she fell asleep, and when she woke up, he had her chained in the sleeper compartment 
and was starting to take her clothes off. He had his truck modified. He had put some anchors on both sides of the sleeper where he could put handcuffs attached to a chain on her feet and the same thing with her hands. But she also said that, you know, I was going to see the president. It uh, makes you wonder what her grip on reality is. And then you take that back to the allegations she's made. And is that a credible statement? The head in this broad is not playing with his full back. The mental state of the distressed woman meant there was a chance that Rhodes could walk free. I think Rhodes believed he was going to get away with this because he very deliberately chose victims who were vulnerable. Um, this particular victim had some mental health issues. Um, she experienced delusions. But the police were very good at their jobs here, and they observed that this woman's story never changed. It was consistent, and that was what mattered. Some of the things that helped corroborate her statement, she said that when Rhodes approached her, she was fighting, trying to, trying to get away from him and said, I bit him on his shoulder. Hey, can you remove your shirt from me? Uh, do I have it? I prefer not. And he had a bite mark on his shoulder. The case didn't go to trial. Uh, Rhodes agreed to uh, enter a guilty plea on a plea bargain and got a reduced sentence on it. In December 1990, Rhodes was sentenced to six years for the kidnap and sexual assault of the young woman. While Rhodes was in custody, Bob had begun to unearth the past of the 45-year-old truck driver. Well, the first thing I did was check our national database for his criminal history, and I found he was a suspect in a, a previous kidnapping. I called the Houston Police Department and spoke to a detective in the sex crimes unit and obtained his report. The report told the story of the woman who was raped and kidnapped, but refused to identify Rhodes in February 1990. Bob was now aware of two cases where women had slipped through the grasp of Robert Ben Rhodes. But he was certain that searching the trucker's apartment would uncover any darker secrets. I talked to the apartment manager after she saw in the paper that he'd been arrested, she went up to his apartment to take a look and told me that she saw women's garments all over the apartment. He also had um, chains and handcuffs, and there was a white towel that had a lot of blood on it. There were some um, racks where he could uh, chain somebody to. The apartment bore all the hallmarks of a sexual predator. I found a stack of photographs. I think they were in his dresser drawer. And it showed a young girl who uh, was in various stages of dress. He had, had a lot of nude pictures of her. He had pictures of her chained up. And I could tell that he had held her for a while because on some of the photographs, she, she had some bruises but over time, the bruises were changing color. So that told me that she had been captive for at least a week or so. So they knew that at very least, he has definitely harmed other women and at worst killed them, but they didn't have any actual cases to connect this evidence to. So this was the beginning of a very long investigation. The pictures of the young girl preyed on Bob's mind. I tried to identify the girl. I, I carried a picture with me, and every time I went to a different police department, I'd show it to the officers to uh, see if uh, any of them recognized her, did they have a missing person case or anything like that. In September 1990, over 800 miles away in Bond County, Illinois, reports of the discovery of a body landed on the desk of Detective Michael Sheely. So I went out to this rural community and met with the sheriff out there, and um, he had told me that a local farmer was going to donate this particular barn to the fire department to burn down. And he was making a last minute inspection and had found what he believed to be the remains of a human body. 
The badly decomposed body was found up in the hayloft, and it was clear the victim had been murdered. It was very apparent that there had been a wire garret made, a ligature, if you will, to place it around the victim's neck. And it's our belief that she was bound and handcuffed over a large beam that raised her hands up, and it's our belief that he placed a wire around her neck, then he continued to squeeze that with this broken piece of board throughout and then strangled her to death. And he twisted this ligature at least 16 times, according to the medical examiner. So he would not only have enjoyed torturing her, but he would have enjoyed watching her die. A forensic anthropologist believed that the body had been in the barn for about six months. The other thing he did is that he gave us gender identification, said it was the body of a young girl. He gave us an age range between 14 and 16 years old. He gave us hair color, which we thought would assist in the identification early on. What was alarming is we had uh, approximately 950 missing female girls that fit her profile and fit the time of death. So it became overwhelming initially. Michael sent out details of the victim to missing persons departments across the country. A detective in Pasadena, Texas, soon got back to him. And she contacted me and she said that her victim, a runaway identified as Regina K. Walters, her family had received an anonymous telephone call after her disappearance, saying that she had been left in a barn. Regina's father receives a call on his unlisted number. So this is a number that isn't publicly available. Regina's one of the few people who actually know it. And he doesn't recognize the caller, but the caller tells him that he knows where Regina is, that she's in a barn, that he's cut her hair. And when her father asks, is she still alive? The caller hangs up. So immediately, a lot of red flags that this really sounds like this could be our victim. And so I asked if she had dental records. The dental records confirmed that the body belonged to Regina Walters, who was just 14 years old. Detectives could finally put a name to the face on the shocking photographs that had been found in Rhodes' apartment. Well, the, the photographs to identify the young person would, would have been impossible for me uh, from being out there. But the barn that she entered I knew every square foot of that barn. I had, I had seen that barn for days and days. And so the minute I saw the photographs of her entering the barn and going into the barn loft and the beams, it just gave you that eerie feeling that, that that's exactly what had happened here. And, and so we were on to this case. Two photos of Regina in particular were difficult to look at. He had chronologically photographed her. The most telling for us was how he had taken photographs and staged her death and had staged them during the course right before he'd killed her. And looking in her eyes and looking at her face, you can tell that she's terrified. Um, and at that point, she's just, just minutes from being killed. When you see a photograph like that, you have to control your emotions. It's a piece of evidence that you're looking at. You have to realize what your goal is. Your goal is to take this piece of evidence, tie it to someone, and be able to put that person in jail. The story of how Regina Walters ended up in the truck of Robert Ben Rhodes is a tragic one. Regina had a boyfriend, Ricky Jones, and she and Ricky decided to run away one day. They were out on the highway hitchhiking and Rhodes stopped his truck and picked him up and took off with her. Um, and that's the last that, um, that she was seen. She's just really a beautiful, young, almost just totally normal 14-year-old girl with just a little rebellion streak. Unfortunately, um, she made the wrong decision. Rhodes kept Regina prisoner in the makeshift torture chamber of his truck for two weeks. It's widely believed that he disposed of her 18-year-old boyfriend, Ricky, almost immediately. He was never seen again. She was the prize, and the boyfriend was just surplus to requirements. 
While the investigation into Regina's murder continued, Rhodes remained in prison for kidnap and sexual assault. But by early 1992, he was due out on parole. So the clock was ticking for us to make a case against Rhodes. Detectives in Texas and Illinois had been working together to build the case against Rhodes. If they didn't charge him soon, the dangerous killer would be released. Finally, they had enough evidence. The district attorney in Bond County, Illinois, issued an arrest warrant for Rhodes for the murder of Regina Walters just prior to him being released from prison in Arizona. And Detective Sheely flew out to the prison to serve him with the arrest warrant and to bring him back to Illinois to face the charges. Detective Michael Sheely remembers meeting Rhodes in the Arizona prison and confronting him with the evidence linking him to Regina. He was cold, he was calculated. Um, he didn't have any trouble looking you square in the eye and saying he's not involved. We provided him with the arrest warrant for murder. Still no reaction, nothing at all. And so I had a eight by 10 photograph of Regina and I put it on the table in front of him, turned it around and I said, this is your victim. And that was the first time any emotion out of, out of him, but it wasn't a, an emotion of, of sorrow or an emotion of, of something that he had done. It was, he was angry and he got up and said that the interview was over. He wouldn't speak to us any longer. At a court hearing on the 11th of September, 1992, Rhodes agreed to a plea bargain. He admitted to murdering Regina Walters so he wouldn't have to face the death penalty. Um, the courtroom was packed, a great deal of spectators. There had been a lot of interest in this case because there was now speculation that he was a serial killer. He didn't just plead guilty, he pled guilty with a smile. He was reveling in the trauma that he created. And for me, that shows that he was still very much the sexual sadist that he'd always been. This is somebody who hadn't changed whatsoever. And I think he enjoyed the opportunity to relive the details of these killings. Regina Walters' family couldn't travel all the way from Texas to Illinois to be in the courtroom, but Michael Sheely made sure he conveyed their feelings to the killer. As he was beginning to exit the courtroom, I just became overly aware, if you will, that there was no one there on behalf of Regina. And so I, I mentioned to him in a very small, faint voice as he began to pass me that it was my certainly my pleasure that I was going to get to send him into prison for the rest of his life. And um, he was uh, really upset at that comment and, uh, and told me to, um, to get and so um, maybe um, not as professional as I should have been, I returned um, and told him where he was going. I was hoping that that was gonna happen to him. So that was my last real conversation with Robert Ben Rhodes. And looking back at it, I'm kind of glad that that's what I told him. With Rhodes behind bars, investigations continued into possible victims of the killer. There were many missing persons who fitted his MO. Rhodes would target his victims, generally people that either had mental deficiencies or heavy drug users that he picked up hitchhiking. Uh, he referred to them as lot lizards. These are, as he described, women that hang around truck stops to uh, take care of the truckers or to swap sex for rides somewhere. He is so itinerant. He literally crosses state line after state line after state line all over the United States. They aren't to know it, but when they climb into the cab of Rhodes' truck, their lives are to change forever. In 2003, 11 years after Rhodes had been imprisoned for the murder of Regina Walters, Texas Ranger Brooks Long began investigating the disappearance of two hitchhiking newlyweds. Douglas Iskowski and Patricia Walsh, who'd been missing since January 1990. They were both from Seattle, Washington. They had basically given up their personal belongings and were traveling to the East Coast of the United States, primarily for religious reasons. The family searched extensively for them, but then 
the remains of Douglas were located around 1990, but there was not a formal identification of it being Douglas Iskowski until 1992 through dental records. So there wasn't much to go on. There was no witnesses. There were several suspects, but nobody was actually linked to the crime. 28-year-old Douglas's remains had been discovered in Crockett County, Texas. Brooks wanted to look at the ballistic evidence that had been found at the scene. Mr. Zyskowski was shot multiple times in the head. He was shot with a Jennings J-22 semi-automatic handgun. This information was obtained by not only the projectiles removed from his head, but also the casings that were left behind on the crime scene that were collected by law enforcement. So what was unique about the ballistic information was that the ammunition used in the murder of Mr. Zyskowski was very rare. This Tarson-branded ammunition had a noticeable T on the casings. This fact had initially ruled Rhodes out as the potential killer. The reason he was eliminated at that time was simply because the ammunition that was seized from Robert Ben Rhodes was marketed under the name of Arms Corps. Brooks contacted the Casa Grande police to take a closer look at the ammunition that was found in Rhodes' truck when he was arrested for kidnap back in April 1990. And when he called me, I asked him to open the Arms Corps box and to describe the head stamp on the casing. And he said, it's a T. So that was the first clue that this is the guy, most probably is the guy, and we need to put efforts and resources into this because that all matched. With a possible link between Rhodes and Douglas secured, Brooks gathered all the information he had on the killer and concentrated his efforts towards connecting Rhodes to Douglas's 24-year-old wife, Patricia Walsh. She's probably out there somewhere and they may not even know who she is because Douglas had no identification, he had no clothing, uh, Regina K. Walters didn't have any identification. She didn't have any clothing. So when you looked at those two situations, what I started doing was looking for a red-headed female in her mid-20s that was probably naked and would have been shot with a Jennings J-22 handgun with toss and ammunition. Brooks received word of a possible unidentified body in Millard County, Utah. So after I obtained that information, I reached out to the Millard County Sheriff's Office and inquired as to the status of that case. And what I was told by their chief deputy was, we haven't solved it, and the skeletal remains are actually inside our evidence vault. So I was able to tell him, I know who that victim is, and I also know who killed her. Brooks was right. Dental records revealed that the remains belonged to Patricia Walsh. Millard County had projectiles and had casings that matched. The same gun killed Douglas Zaskowski, killed Patricia Candace Walsh. So that was linked. Then the timeline on the records, we were able to determine that Rhodes was traveling westbound. So what made sense was, is he eliminated Douglas Zaskowski first. Douglas was essentially just a barrier because Patricia was what Rhodes wanted. So he killed Douglas, he dumped his body very quickly, but he kept Patricia alive for seven days and he tortured her and he raped her before he eventually killed her and disposed of her body. In 2003, 13 years after her remains had been found in Utah, Patricia Walsh had been identified, another innocent victim of Robert Ben Rhodes. Patricia must have been absolutely terrified during the days that she spent with Rhodes. And I think during this time, she probably tried to placate him. She probably tried to plead with him and interact with him. But there would be absolutely no reaction to that from Rhodes because this guy was essentially a killing machine. He wasn't affected by other people's trauma or, or emotion. He got off on people's fear. And I think the more afraid that Patricia was, the more he enjoyed it. 
Investigators still needed to find some hard evidence that link Rhodes to the newlywed hitchhikers before they could prosecute him with their murders. So now became an analysis and comparison not only for DNA under Douglas Zaskowski, now there was analysis to be done in comparisons relating to Patricia Candace Walsh. And what had happened on that is eventually there was an, a match that was located on a white towel that was seized from Robert Ben Rhodes's truck that was matched to the DNA of Patricia Candace Walsh. So there was an affirmative link. The MO, the timeline, these things fit. And Rhodes was in custody. He was in jail in the state of Illinois. By March 2012, Rhodes had served 20 years for the murder of Regina Walters, but he was due to be released. Now, investigators needed to convince a grand jury that he was guilty of two more slayings before Rhodes was freed. Once again, the clock was ticking. Texas Ranger Brooks Long needed a jury to indict Rhodes based on the new facts he'd uncovered. The Crockett County Grand Jury returned two indictments for capital murder on Robert Ben Rhodes for the murder of Douglas Scott Zyskowski and Patricia Candace Walsh based on the evidence and the information that was presented. So essentially he was extradited and detained in the state of Texas. And as we were preparing for trial, he pled guilty to both cases and received multiple life sentences. The killings of Douglas and Patricia took the number of Rhodes' known victims to at least three. After working as a truck driver for over a decade, he'd honed his method of murder. I think that Robert Ben Rhodes preyed on people that I think we coined the term later as disposable. He looked at people that had some checkered history, people that, that he believed wouldn't immediately be missed. And so I think he systematically profiled his victim, if you will. And I think he was very good at it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those folks out there. And Rhodes knew that. He had an endless supply of people that he could prey on, and he did. As far as Rhodes is concerned, any woman hitchhiking or working in a truck stop is fair game. And after all, who's going to miss them? It is a perfect combination. If you were to devise a fictional serial killer, Rhodes would be a very, very good example. Brooks Long continued his search for victims of Rhodes. There was one obvious person to start with, Ricky Jones, the 18-year-old boyfriend of Regina Walters. After the work had been done to identify who the killer was relating to Douglas Zaskowski and Patricia Walsh, then there was resources put into myself in trying to locate Ricky Lee Jones. Because as I reviewed the file and reached out to officers and witnesses in that case, it was obvious that he had never been located. His remains had never been found. Ricky had been missing since early 1990. Evidence found in Rhodes' truck when he was arrested in Arizona just weeks after that suggested that he could be the killer. During the course of the search that was done by the FBI, there was a notebook that was found, a very, very alarming notebook where Rhodes had kept information. In that information, in that notebook, was phone numbers and, and family names. Um, there was even a notation with a drawing of a knife with, with what appeared to be like blood drops. And it said, Ricky's dead. Ricky Jones is dead. Brooks sent out information to police departments. He was desperate to locate Ricky. We didn't get anything back from these agencies. But as I, on my own, started searching unsolved homicides and looking at various databases online, I essentially came across a young white male's remains that were found in Mississippi. I then reached out to law enforcement, and it was unfortunate because we were able to obtain some teeth from the remains in Mississippi, and we were able to obtain samples, biological samples, from Ricky Lee Jones' biological mother. 
and those were compared and they were matched. So we knew that we'd located Ricky Lee Jones. The bad part about that was that the remains could not all be located. So Robert Ben Rhodes has never stood trial for the abduction and murder of Ricky Lee Jones, simply because there was a lack of evidence. Despite not being able to link Rhodes to the crime, it is widely believed that he did kill the 18-year-old before murdering Ricky's girlfriend, Regina Walters. Investigators believe Rhodes is responsible for the deaths of many more innocent people. This is a case that is, is unresolved. It's a case that's incomplete. There are going to be many, many families across America missing relatives who've been murdered by this individual, and they deserve justice. I think during the course of the investigation, and initially, um, we believe that it was probably in the neighborhood of probably 10 to 15. But as the investigation grew and, and the FBI spent a lot of time with it, the behavioral science unit, spent a great deal of time and effort, and they had actually linked him up to approximately 45 homicides through, throughout the United States that not only fit his profile, but fit his timeline as well as a truck driver. I don't think there's any doubt that there's other victims and there's other crimes that can be linked to Robert Ben Rhodes. I think that science and the ability to link potential suspects through DNA are somewhat limited in this case because of his MO and what he would do with those victims. But as other agencies become aware of Robert Ben Rhodes, hopefully some of this information will get back to the right investigator or officer or even family member that might be able to listen and say, hey, why don't you look at this guy? Whatever the true number of victims, there could have been many more had it not been for a chance encounter on the side of the I-10 in Casa Grande, Arizona, in April 1990. The most striking moment in, in the case is that wonderful Arizona Highway Patrol officer coming upon this rig with its hazard lights flashing, climbing up, looking through the window and seeing a young woman trapped in the car who starts screaming. That was the moment in which finally Rhodes's extraordinary run of killing came to an end. And had that officer not gone to check on that truck, he could well be killing people right now. I had a phone call from her many, many, many years ago. She, and she thanked me for, uh, for saving her life. I said, well, hey, I'm just doing my job. You enjoy your life and have a good one. Glad you, you have a life to have. Robert Ben Rhodes remains safely behind bars at the Minard Correctional Center in Illinois. He will never be released from prison. I think that Robert Ben Rhodes is probably the most evil person I've ever met in my life. And I've met a lot of evil people. I hesitate and always have hesitated to use the word monster, but Rhodes certainly deserves to be called a monster. And I dealt with many murderers, but of all of those, the one that stands out as far as the lack of emotion, the lack of remorse, he wins the prize by far. There is no feeling to this man. There is no inkling of remorse. There's no inkling of anything. The only regret he has is that he got caught. Robert Ben Rhodes is a cold-blooded sexual predator who preyed upon vulnerable women for his own self-gratification. He would chain his victims in his truck and torture them before disposing of their lifeless bodies in the most callous manner. Only Rhodes knows exactly how many people he has killed, and his reluctance to give closure to the loved ones of his victims undoubtedly makes him one of the world's most evil killers.